Are y'all glad to be in the house of Jesus this morning? Come on. Hey, man, give the Lord praise for uh, him allowing and giving the provision for us to even make this possible. And uh, man, we got some people in the house here that brave the elements, come out to serve and worship Jesus. Man, we're going to have a big old snowball fight after service. Y'all want to? Cool. All right. It might be a slush ball or something. I don't know, man. But anyway, man, thank you guys for being here. And, and man, praise God for technology and welcoming uh, everybody in that, that's uh, at home today and uh, welcoming you into the service. And I, I hope that right now that you are prayerfully making your living room, your bedroom, wherever you are right now, God's holy worship place right now. So welcome to Impact Church. If you're visiting with us, listening to the sermon for the first time, welcome. And we hope if you're searching for a church home, the Lord would, would lead you to be a part of what God's doing. An amazing work right here at, at Impact Church. So um, here we are on a, on a snowy Sunday that we knew was going to happen. And a lot of work had to go into this, even, you know, running the heaters all night, keeping the snow off the tents, especially our kids' tent in the back, so it didn't become a, a pancake uh, with, under the pressure of all the snow. So uh, stayed overnight, running the heaters, knocking snow off the roof, all that kind of stuff. So uh, we could have a place to worship Jesus week in and week out. So praise God for what he's done. And uh, also it, um, needs to be said, kind of uh, hope everybody's feeling well. I know some people were exposed to some of the, uh, the virus stuff that over the past couple weeks. So um, hope everybody is, is well. We've been praying for a few folks. And that being said, you know, continuously as we continue to meet and we make it a point at Impact Church to come every Sunday and worship Jesus like we talked about last week there's joy in the gathering and we're not going to forsake the gathering we still want people to be smart and if you've been exposed to to any virus for that sake and anybody in your house or you're sick or feeling symptoms you know obviously there's so many other ways to worship choose to, to, to not come in person that Sunday until you're clear and uh, worship from home, worship and drive in if you want, you know, do what you need to do, but let's be safe and be mindful of others. So uh, the Lord has blessed us so far. We have not had an outbreak of any kind of any virus since we've started Impact Church and even in this corona. We've been doing uh, ser service every single Sunday since March 29th of last year without missing a break. Give Jesus some big round of applause for that because that is his provision. And uh, like I said, we're not back and down. We're not living in fear, but we're going to live wise. So I uh, want you to encourage you to do the same. So biggest thing we can do to stay well, wash your hands, right? Keep washing your hands. Uh, you know, if you want to listen to Fauci, you can put two, three, four masks on until you pass out, whatever. But whatever, you can, wear the, you can wear four masks all day long. If you don't wash your hands, you're going to get sick, baby. You know what I'm saying? So wash your hands, all right, and stay well. We love to see you here next Sunday. Speaking about next Sunday, Super Bowl Sunday next week. All right, and at Impact Church uh, on Super Bowl Sundays, we invite everybody that wants to to wear a football jersey. Wear your favorite team's football jersey, even if your team's not in the Super Bowl, doesn't matter. You might even not like the NFL. You might want to wear a college football jersey. That's fine. So wear your football jerseys next week, and uh, we're going to have a big Super Bowl uh, kind of get-together, calling it the Big Game Bash or whatever we're calling it. And uh, we want everybody to be a part of that. So uh, look for that uh, on our Facebook page. And, and do me a favor. It's set up as an event. Hit... Uh, uh, how you're planning to attend that or not, if you will. So we get a kind of an idea how many people will be coming so we can prepare in advance for the food. But it's going to be a great day. If we get a chance, we'll have a, a youth versus adult flag football game and some of us adults might break a hip out here trying to play football. So y'all might want to come be a part of that so you can laugh at us as we're in pain on the ground. All right. But uh, if we get to do that, we'll have a flag football game weather dependent before the Super Bowl get together and have a great time of fellowship for everybody. So look forward to that. So now, this Sunday, continuing in our joy ride. Are y'all ready? Hey man, I hope you came ready because we have a, a great message today. And even though the attendance is smaller in here, the attendance is a expositionally larger on Facebook, all right? So for all of you, I want to welcome you into this sermon series that we started a couple weeks ago, ago as we are going expositionally through the book of Philippians in a sermon series called Joy Ride. And we can take a joy ride, guys, even in the most uncertain and challenging of circumstances. And that's been the theme, and that's been the message that I believe, I believe the Lord wants everybody to get from this. You know, we started this new year with a message called No Looking Back. 
And we talked about how God has called us to not look back into the, to the things of 2020 or even to the things years ago in our past that want to hold us back or to take our focus off of moving forward. But like Paul said, that forgetting what's behind me, I press on toward the mark for which Christ has called me in Christ Jesus. Amen? How many of you know we have to keep looking forward to move forward? It's kind of hard to go forward if you're looking behind you. So we have to press on. And, and so as a part of that message was this whole take of keeping our focus on Christ and what's important. And guys, as we move through this series, we'll see that that's the secret to joy. That's the secret to long-lasting fulfillment that is present no matter what your circumstances may be. So that's the kind of joy that God's talking about with a focus on him. So as we're now a few weeks into, oh, really a month, into 2021, how's your focus going? Not just how's your year going, how's your focus going? Because that's what we've been talking about. Because there's so many things that are going to want to distract you and get your focus on the things that are negative, things that want to drag you down, things that make you feel fearful, things that make you feel uncertain of the future. But Christ doesn't want us to live like that. Christ does not want us to live in fear. He does not want us to live in uncertainty because we have a guaranteed hope in him, church. And so we have a guaranteed joy that's set before us even in the darkest of circumstances. And we're going to see that here as we look at this passage in Philippians today. All right? But have you been able so far to focus on Christ, or to really focus on the mission and the joy that God wants to set in your heart? Have you set your mind's goal on Christ and you've forgotten what's behind and you're pressing forward to what's ahead? So how has your 2021 been? How, are you finding the good in what's there, the good is, that could be to come? You know, there's a, a certain creature that had an interview that I'm going to show a picture of here. And uh, <laughs> look at that. It's a deer. And an interviewer, a reporter come in and, and, and stuck the microphone in his face and said, so how's your 2021 going so far? And he says, well, to be honest, I'm pretty excited about the ammo shortage. See, there's always a way you can find good in something, right? A little humor with that. But where's the good that you can focus on as we move forward to what God has called us to as a church and what God has called to you and your family to this year? Because I'm going to be honest, there's a lot of crazy stuff going on in our world today. It really is. A lot of negative crazy stuff. I've heard a lot of stuff coming out of people's mouths that obviously are very deceived and blinded to the evil that's in their own hearts and the foolishness just spews out of their mouth. <laughs> Heard a lady this week uh, t talking, I believe it was somebody on Fox News and, and talking about how now we're going to call babies babies. We're not going to call them a baby anymore. We're going to call them a baby until the age of four because that's when I'm, I, I'm not making this stuff up, guys. This is coming out of somebody's mouth, dude, a human being that we're not going to call him a boy or a girl until age four. We're going to let the child decide at age four, age five, what do they want to be a boy or a girl? That's, that was on the news. That's foolishness. That's, that's deceptive evil in the hearts of people that has blinded people to the truth. And they talk foolishness. We've seen these, this past 10 to 14 days of a new administration where Laws are being written for abortions to be more easy and for, for taxpayers' money to fund abortions, even overseas. We've seen laws written where now boys can, can go in girls' bathrooms, and even the very state of Virginia that we live in is about to pass legislation to make that happen in your school, where your kids go. And now boys can play girls' athletics, of all things. Are you kidding me? I mean, you see the foolishness and, and, and the stuff that can, and, and it's, it's just pure evil. And don't get me wrong, all right? We have a commandment in 1 Timothy chapter 2 to pray for our leaders, all right? But there's a big difference between praying for your leaders and supporting them. Can I be very honest? Or celebrating their position, maybe because of a skin color or a gender. We can't do that when there's evil in the heart. Man looks on the outside, but God looks on the inside. And it's about time that we, as followers of Jesus Christ, start caring more about what's on the inside than what's on the outside of a person. Because we see the evil that's being manifested out. So we are to pray. 
And you might say, Brad, man, that's good. I've been praying every day. I pray that they get disoriented and fall off a cliff. Well, no, that's not how we pray for them, all right? But we don't necessarily pray for them to be popular either. We don't pray for the, the evil laws and stuff that they put out to be glorified. And, and, and we don't pray in, in, in support of that. There's a big difference, guys. How do we pray then? First and foremost, you know how we pray? We pray for them to find Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of their life. That's how we pray. We pray for their heart to be changed for eternity because I promise you, the evil that may be in their heart, if Jesus truly takes over, will be cast out, right? So that's our first prayer. And then if that does not happen, then we pray for God to restrain the evil that's in their heart. Because we know the Proverbs tells us that the, the heart of the king is like a stream of water and he turns it where he wants. Hey, you know, maybe God wanted America to have some evil happen so that people can get a taste of maybe if this is what they really wanted or not. And maybe we'll see some people come to a, a light and be like, oh, I don't want this. Maybe I will vote different next time or, or, or maybe I will change how I think and how I see things in this world and turn to Christ. But regardless, there's evil all around. And that's to be expected. The Bible tells us in the last days that this would happen, that wrong would become right and right would become wrong. And that's exactly what we're seeing. So in the midst of that, how do we find joy? How do we, I mean, really, how do we find true, authentic joy and happiness? Because I want to let you know that the source of joy is always found in following the two greatest commandments that Jesus gave. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love others as you love yourself. If we start there, and then we have a joy and a commitment to the fellowship and the gathering like we talked about last week, and then we have a joy in the mission, which is the title of our message this week, the joy in the mission. When we have this Christ-centered focus, we have produced a God-given joy in our heart that we're not going to find anywhere else in the world. Do you believe that, church? Because we're going to see it, and we have seen it so far, and we're going to continually see it right here out of Paul in Philippians. And it's so huge that we grasp this, that this is the source of joy. How do you find joy? It's hard to find right here. In Christ, Christ-centered focus, eternal focus, focused on and committed to the gathering and focused on the mission that God has set before us. Because do you know that you are called to be on mission? That you're called no matter what the circumstances are to further the gospel of Jesus Christ. Every single one of us, not just me, not just the Impact Church, everybody that's a claimed follower of Jesus Christ. Can we do that in the midst of the chaos and restrictions around us? Let me pray for us before we dive in. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. We praise you, Lord, for who you are and Lord, for what you're doing, Lord, in our community, in our church, and in the hearts of people. Lord, I pray right now that you would clear our minds ahead of all the foolishness and stuff that's going on in our world today right now. Let us focus and hear from you on how you would have us live in the midst of this challenging time that we're living in. Lord, how would you have us further the gospel? How would you have us stand? How would you have us live our life in such a way that it exemplifies Christ? where we don't live in rebellion and exact disobedience against authority like you've called us to do in Romans 13, but yet we don't support it either. We don't support evil. We don't glorify it. We don't join up with it. But Lord, we stand and we honor you before we honor a man. We honor your word before we honor any law. We honor your truth. Even in the midst of persecution, as we're going to see Paul bring to us today. That even in the midst of this, he still had joy and he still had a focus on the mission and a commitment to bring your gospel to those who need it. Lord, can we hear that message today? Because that is where we're going to find joy in our purpose through suffering, is still being on mission for you. 
Lord, I pray that you would speak to our heart and I praise you for everything that you're about to do through the presentation of your word in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so here we go. Just a quick recap. We know we went last week and uh, we've been through the previous weeks through the first uh, 11 verses of Philippians. And we know Paul last week was specifically talking about the fellowship uh, and, and how he longed to be in the gathering of God's people and in the fellowship. And then he, he talked specifically about how he had them in his heart and that he longed to be with them. And, and we brought this concept of family and gathering together. And very specifically, in verse 9, he moved into this prayer for God's people. And this was so important, that he prayed for, for basically for love to abound in them and that they would grow in knowledge and judgment and discernment. And we talked about how there was even joy and growth in Christ and how God's called us to do that. So now I want to read for us our passage today. Philippians chapter 1 verses 12 through 18 and it's so important we understand what Paul's been saying before we read this because as you know this is all written as one letter. This isn't chopped up into verses and in paragraphs and different divisions like it is in your Bible when Paul wrote it. This was one continuous letter. So with what we've read previously in mind now let's read verses 12 through 18. But I want you to know brethren that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all of the rest that my chains are in Christ and most of the brethren in the Lord having become confident by my chains are much more bold to speak the word without fear. <clears throat> I love that. Some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife, and some also from goodwill. The former preached Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my chains, but the latter out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and in this I rejoice, yes, and I and will rejoice. So we see the joy and the rejoicing of this at the end, and this joy that's in his heart. And here's the focus, and, and this is why it's so important. Guys, Paul is in prison, he's in change, and he is under an evil leadership in Rome right now. There is as the emperor of Rome is Nero Claudius Caesar. What a name, right? And this brother doesn't want people to preach Jesus and don't want anybody to say anything about it. So does Paul say, oh, well, Romans 13, I, I wrote that. I have to be obedient to my authority. Nope, only up until the point where it goes against the word of God. That's when you cannot be obedient. Can we hear that church of Jesus Christ? Can we please hear that? Because we have a calling, we have an authority that is over the authority placed above us. Authority has been placed by God in our land, that is scripture. And we are to walk in obedience and peace as much as we can. But up until the point where it is commanded us that we cannot go against God's word, no matter what that calling may bring. So here's this situation, Nero said, man, you can't preach the word. Paul busts right up in the city, preaches the word, gets thrown in jail, all right? So now he's under this house arrest situation where he's actually chained to different guards every shift. Can you picture that? So it's not just he's in a cell by himself. He's actually chained to another guard and these guards have shifts and they're coming in continuously, day after day, week after week, month after month. So how many people do you think Paul's in contact with? A lot, a lot. Do you see the opportunities here that God's giving Paul even in the midst of persecution? Man, can we get that message? Because what you and I have to do is the same thing Paul had to do. We have to figure out how we're going to respond when something like this potentially happens to us. And it may not be chains in a guard and chained to a person. It may just be persecution socially. Maybe somebody unfriending us on Facebook or, or, or a long time, even high school buddy or friend, man, that just kind of breaks ties or, or, or it, there's some animosity there because of where you stand in Christ. 
And, and what are you going to do when that time comes? Are you going to buckle? Are you going to sugarcoat the gospel? Are you going to shy away from it because it's not popular? Or are we going to stand and preach God's word like it's supposed to be preached? Like it's supposed to be done with truth in love. And that's the, that's the key right there is truth and love. If we do all love, all love, 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 we can love somebody straight to hell. Because we're never giving them the truth. And if we just truth, 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 truth without love, it's like we're beating them over the head with the Bible. Okay? So we have to have truth and love. And that's where the importance of both comes in as we live our lives for Jesus. So how will you and I stand if the day ever comes of persecution? Will we stand for Christ? Will we keep our eyes focused on the mission and have joy in our heart as Paul does? I've heard it said, and maybe many of you have, that life is only 10% what happens to you, but it's 90% how you respond to it. Have you found that to be true in your life? 10% what happens, but 90% how you respond, and how much more true is it with this message today as to how we're going to respond to further the gospel even in the midst of difficult times. So who gets reached here? Let's look at this. This is important. So Paul, right off the bat, is coming out, and he's saying, man, I want you to know, brethren, he just talked about the church of Philippi, man, he said, man, I want to be with you. I, I got you in my heart. I want you to grow in Christ and in truth. And then he says, man, I, but I want you to know, yeah, I'm in prison, that the things which have happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. So that it's become evident to who? The whole palace guard. Did he say some of the palace guard? Did he say a few of them? Who has the gospel become evident to? Everybody where that brother was. Hey, does everybody, everywhere you go at work, at school, on your ball team, know about Jesus because you were there? That's what happened with Paul. Everybody knew about the gospel. Everybody. Because he was here in chains. Man, what a testimony. We already heard about the Philippian jailer that we read about in Acts there a couple weeks ago with this church plant at Philippi, how him and Silas in prison praising God and, and man, the, the, the earth shook, the chains fell down and they didn't run. The jailer was about to kill himself and, and, and he knew they were still there and he said, stop. And then that jailer said, sirs, man, I've heard your praise. I've heard the joy in your heart in the midst of all this. What do I need to do to be saved? Guys, that's it. That's living in the sweet spot of life. No matter what the circumstances are, that there's a sweet spot when we follow Christ and we live with a focus on him and his uh, a great commission that he's given us. It gives us purpose. And there's a sweet spot on a baseball bat. I don't know how many of you like baseball, but there's this sweet spot on the bat. And you can hit the ball anywhere on the bat and make it go somewhere. But when you hit the ball in the sweet spot of the bat, man, it just sails. It's the pop that sends it over the fence. That's where God wants you to live right now. Did you know that? That's where God wants you to live, even these, in these challenging, hard, and, and, and negative of times. And we see evil all around us. God wants us to live in the sweet spot. And that's where the focus on him and others and on the mission. Man, it's huge. So these palace guards were witnessed to. And the trail of the gospel was blazed first amongst the people. Get this who were keeping Paul restricted. I'm going to get that message. So who might you be able to witness to? Is it only your friends? Only the ones that like you? No, it could possibly even be your enemies. Those that want to restrict you. Did you ever think about that? That those are the ones that God's put in your place to minister to possibly even first? And they see Christ and how you respond to them and, and how you live your life. And even those that were restricting Paul, who were against his message, were furthered by the gospel. And many came to probably know him, no doubt. It was not said here, but it was at the end. And this is what's beautiful. We'll get to that at the end. So not only just the guards, I don't want you to think about this, the, the prison guards that were actually chained to Paul, but there was prison guards all in this facility because Nero had this kind of extra special security force called the Praetorian Guard. And these were very, like almost special forces type uh, guards and bodyguards that were around the palace. So even they knew 
of the gospel and the gospel was further to all the palace guards. That's why he said, these bonds I'm in are actually Christ's. You ever thought about the difficult circumstances, the hard times that we're in, the hard times that we're called to walk through? Maybe God allowed for the furtherance of the gospel through us. That'll change your perspective. That'll give you joy in the midst of your chains when we change our mindset that way. I mean, can you imagine the conversations that Paul must have had with these people as they were chained up to him? I mean, this minister of the gospel man that just had, obviously had Christ radiating out of him. And they were chained up to him and, and you could hear the guard probably come in and be like, man, what you here for? I'm here for preaching about Jesus. Who's Jesus? I'm glad you asked. How long's your shift? Right? I mean, hey, we got time to sit down. We're going to talk about Jesus. I'm going to tell you everything about who he is. So these people were ministered to right here with Paul chained up to him in person. So think about this. A lot of them probably received Christ. And then as Paul continually, week after week, month after month was in prison, he got to know a lot of them. And then so after they received Christ, man, on their next shift that he was with them, what was he starting to do then? Disciple them, baby. Oh, man, that's beautiful. So think about this. People, the Roman guards that Nero is paying big time money, like these palace guards and everything, three times a normal guard, they're getting saved and getting discipled on the emperor's time, baby. <laughs> you got to love it. On Nero's nickel, people are getting saved and discipled. That's beautiful. Man, talk about what God can do. Man, I, I used to uh, come home in the summers from college and, and work with uh, my dad. He's an electrician working for Moore's Electric. And we were up at uh, UVA and we were putting in all the electrical stuff and, and the new building for their new uh, sports complex up there at the time beside the football stadium. So anyway, I'm working with all these construction guys and then, you know, we're, I'm coming back from college. I'm just, I'm young and then I'm just trying to make me some money to go back to school, have some gas money and, you know, spend the money, all that kind of stuff. And man, there was this one guy every single day, man, it was like clockwork. It was like 1.30, dude would disappear for about 30 minutes every day. You couldn't find him. And, and after a, a few days, few weeks, whatever it was, I, I noticed him, you know, at one time I, I seen him come out of the porta potty <laughs> I'm like, is that where you go every day at 1.30? He's like, yep, got it on schedule. <laughs> it's like, really? I mean, let, let's be honest. I mean, we're in the summertime in a porta potty That doesn't smell very good, Right? And I mean, it's 90, 90 degree temperatures, 90% humidity. That's not a place a brother just wants to go hang out for 30 minutes every day, right? So I asked him, I'm like, man, why do you go in there every single day at that time and spend that length of time? What's up with that? He's like, man, honestly, I'll let you know right here. He said, uh, boss makes a dollar, I make a dime, so I poop on company time. That's what he said right there, just straight up and simple. So on, on company time, he was doing his own agenda. And you're like, hold up, Brad, man. You know, somebody's visiting today and they're like, did he just really say poop from the pulpit? Welcome to Impact. Sometimes the filter doesn't catch. But anyway, so here's this agenda being taken place on, on the boss's time. And that's exactly what Paul was doing. It's like, man, you're going to throw me in prison for preaching the gospel and you think you're going to shut me up? You got another thing coming because I'm going to preach to your guards and even the people in your own household are going to get saved. Man, that is so beautiful. That is what God can do through a heart that's focused on him. You see, Paul knew that God could work in his life that way. That's why he never viewed himself as a prisoner of Nero but rather as a special forces warrior for Jesus. That's how he viewed himself. Do you view yourself that way? And whatever life will bring it and throw at you? You see, verse, th verse 13 in this passage kind of brings to us here this reminder that his bonds again were in Christ, that his bonds were of Christ. He says that my chains are in Christ. What? Hold up, your chains are from an evil emperor. But he said, no, my chains are in Christ. You see, God has an ordained purpose in me to be here so that I can further the gospel in this area and reach people that wouldn't be reached otherwise. 
So maybe God's putting us sometimes in places that aren't comfortable, that we don't like, but maybe he's put us there if we can keep our focus for the purpose to further the gospel because we have an opportunity to reach somebody that would otherwise not be reached for Jesus. Can we have joy in that? It'll change the way you look at life. You see, Paul was here and instead of griping about how heavy his chains were or how uncomfortable they were or how he wouldn't be doing other things or how the chains hurt his wrist or whatever the case may be, he looked down at the other end of that chain and he saw an opportunity to minister. And how many times do we just get focused on the chains? How many times do we just get focused on what's restricting us and what we don't like? And inside of that, we miss the opportunity to minister. You see, we, as followers of Christ, need to learn to not look at the restriction, but look at the opportunity that's brought because of the restriction, maybe, that we're in. You see, the lesson comes to you and me right now to look past our chains. Can you poke the person, slap the brother or sister beside you, tell them to look past your chains? Because somebody needs to hear that today. Look past your chains right now today, whatever they are, and let's focus on what God has for us. You see, not only these guards, but then it goes further. It says that all to, and to all the rest, and if you look into King James Version, it says in, in all other places, so it wasn't just the gospel being furthered right there. Word was getting out about Jesus coming out of this one dude in prison in chains. So that even outside the palace, I mean, it's cool enough that everybody in the palace, the cooks, the people that brush the camels, whatever, they're all hearing about Jesus. Now everybody outside of the palace is hearing about Jesus because of Paul's furtherance of the gospel in the midst of persecution. Ooh, church, get that. Let's go, let's go. Not only the guards, but everybody was hearing about Christ because of this servant of Jesus. Man, how many people could it radiate out to when we walk in Christ? And we have the joy of the Lord in our heart with a focus on the mission, the, the great commission that the Lord has set us to. And we know that this mission, joy in the mission, the title of our message, is what God wants us to have. And in order to do it, we need to have a but God attitude. Yeah, I may be going through this, but God, do you have that? You ever, you ever said that to yourself? Maybe you get in a bad circumstance and man, life's not going good and man, things are challenging and you just inside your heart, you just want to say, but God, but God's got a plan, but God's going to do something. God is going to make a way no matter what it is. And the goal is always to further the gospel for his glory. And it comes out of this great commission which is the good news of Jesus Christ being taken to places where it's previously unknown. Man, that's what's so beautiful about church planning, what Paul had done here in Philippi, what God's given us an impact, an opportunity to do, to plant a brand new church and, and to reach people that wouldn't normally be reached. You say, Brad, man, that's crazy. We got a church on every corner. How are we taking over new territory? Man, I had the same wrestle and argument with God and I lost because he has a work to do here. And we see that this great commission is very much commanded to all of us. And we know Matthew 28, 19 through 20 is where we get it. It says, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things. And that word observe there leads to obedience. That, that is a, a follow of command. It's obedience. So teaching them to basically obey all that I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That's the Great Commission. That's our command, church. Did you know that that Great Commission is why Impact Church is here? You know, we watched a video at the start and it talked about that our calling is the Great Commission and that we're plan A and there is no plan B. Did you know that? That you're plan A. You are plan A. This church, the global church of Jesus Christ, is plan A. That's it. There is no plan B. We are the command. We are the hands and feet of Jesus right now. That's why it's so important because God has called us to be his ambassadors. What is an ambassador? It's a representative of a foreign place. That's what you are. You're to be a representative of Jesus Christ. 
And that's why it is so important for us to conduct ourselves and to walk our, our lives out like Paul said in Ephesians and like he'll say here in Philippians in a manner worthy of our calling because we're his ambassadors. People are going to see Jesus in us, or they should, or they're not going to see Jesus in us. And so it's either going to draw them to him or get this, push them away from him. I don't know about you, but I don't be the one, I don't want to be the one that repels somebody away from Jesus because of my shortcomings. We're all sinners. We're all going to fail. None of us are going to be perfect. And that's not what I'm calling us to be. But we can strive for perfection in Christ through the Holy Spirit of God in us so that we can live a life worthy of the manner of our calling. That's being an ambassador. And that's honoring the Great Commission. And the, inside this, and just to speak kind of just for a second about what Impact Church stands on we have a mission and a vision statement and I don't know if you know what it is but our mission is establishing Christ followers all right who live in obedience to God's word to make an impact in our community and the world it's the great commission right there in our mission why would the church's mission be anything but that I don't know but there it is right there that's what we're here to do establish Christ followers not church members Christ followers, who what? Live in obedience to God's word, the second part of the Great Commission, to make an impact in our community and the world, that's it. How about our vision? We exist to be a catalyst for revival, through what? Through evangelism, sharing the gospel, and discipleship, teaching them how to obey. Evangelism, discipleship, it's gotta go together to teach them how to obey. So we exist to be a catalyst for revival through evangelism and discipleship, all right? And to see change take place, all right? That we see lives change, that we see families mended and engaged in the local church, and that we see the, the, the love, hope, and power of Christ radiant in our homes, schools, and community. Guys, that's it. That's making an impact. That's when we know that Christ is on the throne of our lives and God is doing his work through us as his vessels. Man, that's what it's about. Even this land that you sit on right now, that you drove out in the snow on, that yeah, there's some tents placed here at the front, but in the future, this is what this land is gonna look like in God's timing. That this is more than just a piece of property, but this is a tool to be used for the gospel. I know that's too small for those of you in here to really see, but that's a sports complex with multiple ball fields, 3D archery range, disc golf course, eventually a a pool if God will have it for for, uh, swim meets, football, soccer, lacrosse fields. Our building's going to be an athletic complex inside where people can come and practice and, and and play AAU travel ball tournaments. And so that people can be exposed to Jesus through the week. This is not going to be a place we just come and squat on Sunday and say, see you next week. This is a place that will be used every day to further the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the mission of Impact Church, and that's the mission that God wants us to have, guys. So this church is all about the Great Commission. We are all about discipleship. We are all about committing our lives to the focus of the mission, because there's joy in that, no matter how hard it may be, because there's a lot of obstacles, I promise you, coming our way, baby. I've already felt some. I've felt some for four years, and God just keeps blowing right through them every single time. I lost all my hair, but God keeps blowing through the obstacles, all right? God's always going to make a way in his timing. So we see that this church is about the mission, that God's called us to be the mission. Paul placed his heart on the mission. He put a high premium premium on that to see God move. And he put his agenda in sync with God's agenda. Is your agenda, your life in sync with God's agenda? Is it? Do you want what God wants for your life or you, do you want what you want for your life? Because there's a big difference because Jesus said, if anyone's going to come after me, if anyone's going to be my disciples, anyone's going to call themselves a Christian, they must what? Deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Because what? What did he say? He said, because if a man wants to save his own life, he's going to what? He's actually going to lose it. So if you and your agenda is only for you, what does the Bible say you're going to do? You're going to lose what you're looking for. 
You're going to lose the joy and peace and purpose that God wants you to have in him. But th that's what Jesus turned and said. But if you're going to lose your life for my sake, that means if you'll surrender your heart and your life to me, you're going to find what you're looking for. Can we hear that message today? God wants us to be set on mission. So we see this in Paul. He's not just passively sitting back in prison, twiddling his thumbs, waiting until he gets out. He's alert. He's working as a missionary, carving out new and exciting ministries in here and, and what he's going to do in the future as he gets out. And that's how we need to be thinking in Christ as well. Verse 14 comes and says that many of them are more confident to speak the word because of this. Did you catch that? It says that most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Oh my goodness. Did you know that you standing for Christ in the mix of your suffering and my suffering can motivate a fellow follower of Jesus Christ to get on mission as well. Do you believe that? Do you know that? I mean, I think about David and Goliath, and we all know the story about when David slew the giant. Man, but what's a beautiful picture to me is, is the Bible said that for 40 days, man, did this giant come up and intimidated the Israelite army. Trained warriors of Jesus Christ were taken back in fear and would not do what they were trained to do for 40 days. And then one cat come up, this little teenager, slew the giant because he stepped up and said, I'm going to honor God with my life. And, and he slew the giant. And what the Bible said just amazes me. And it, just to this day, it just moves my heart. It says that at the moment that David cut the head off of the giant after he slayed him, it says that the Israelite army charged the Philistines. One man. One man making a stand, a step out in faith for God, changed the entire demeanor of a whole army of warriors for Jesus to motivate and move against the enemy. What is God calling you to do that is going to motivate an army, a warrior of Jesus Christ, a sleeping giant, I believe, that needs to be awoken for the gospel to move forward in boldness? And that's what the church had here from Paul was one man saying, I don't care about my change, I'm not going to complain, I'm going to preach the gospel. People are going to get saved right here where I'm at. And it motivated other people to preach the word as well. Bold. Man, it's beautiful. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. Woo! That's good stuff. That's good stuff. It doesn't mean Paul was perfect because we know he wasn't. But he said, I'm going to show you how to sacrifice your life for Jesus and to get it all back. It's beautiful. It's an example of how much he valued the furtherance of the gospel. Because Paul's heart was really Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, which says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for I know it's the power of salvation to all who believe. Right? And we know that after you look at verse 17, that it follows, it says, so, but For in it, for in this gospel is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written the just will live by faith not by fear we will live by faith not by fear we will live by faith in Jesus and we will be bold in our presentation of the gospel why because we are not ashamed of it because we know that there's a world that's lost and dying and going to hell without it Paul's heart was Galatians 2 20 this says for I have been crucified with Christ and it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loves me and gave his life for me. Boy, that's beautiful, man. That, that is a verse right there that you need to memorize and you need to just tack it on your heart. Man, I've been crucified with Christ and it's not me living, it's Christ living in me now. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. Walk in a manner worthy of your calling. It's beautiful. So, basically Paul's saying, a man, if, if me being in prison is what's necessary for others to be motivated to join the fight, then bring on the chains. What? Make it, have you ever thought about that? If, if me being persecuted is what's necessary to further the gospel and to motivate people around me to be bold in their walk, then bring on the chains. Oh, Lord, help us to have a heart like that, sold out for you. Paul closes this passage in verses 15 through 18, talking about the motives that people preach the gospel. 
And Paul was obviously very sensitive to the reason and to the heart behind the people that were presenting the gospel or he wouldn't even think about this. But he made it very clear that some preach the gospel the right way. They do it out of love and and boldness and concern. But he made it very clear that some are preaching the gospel with wrong motives. Have you ever known anybody or felt like somebody was preaching the gospel out of wrong motives? I have. Maybe that the pastor was focused on money. Maybe the pastor was focused on self-gain. Maybe the pastor was focused on fame, writing his books, doing everything else, except focused on the heart of the gospel. After a while, people's motives will manifest themselves outward, especially to those closest around them. So Paul knew this, and Paul obviously knew some people in this area preaching the gospel with wrong motives. Some of them that were insincere, maybe very contentious and hope that things got worse for people that preached the gospel because of the way they were doing it. They had false motives. And you would think that that would have infuriated Paul. And I'm sure as a human being, deep down inside, he probably was frustrated, irritated, maybe even a little angry in the flesh at him. But he ultimately saw the hand of God even at work in that. Why? Because he knew that God's word never returns void when it's preached regardless of the motives of the heart of man. That's beautiful. Isaiah 55, 11 tells us that, that God's word never returns void. You see, what Paul knew is at the end that that pastor or that preacher or that teacher of the word that maybe had a false motive, he's gonna answer to God one day, right? The point is now that the gospel is being presented on earth. Ultimately, though, one day, Matthew 7, 21 through 23, there's going to be many people that come to the Lord and say, uh, but Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name and cast out demons and perform miracles? And Jesus is going to say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. So where's your heart? God knows your heart. The main purpose for us now is to know that the gospel is being preached. God will deal with the heart at the end. So as we close two truths really come popping out today that lead us to very two very key questions for you and me this morning as followers of Jesus first question is this what would you be willing to give up if it resulted in the furtherance of the gospel what would you be willing to give up if it meant the furtherance of the gospel Paul was willing to even give up his freedom and be in chains. Maybe for us right now, that's not going to be the case. May eventually be in the United States, but it's not right now. But we're never going to have to essentially give up our freedom to preach the gospel. But there may be some things we do need to give up so that our testimony shines the light of Christ to others. You ever read Romans 14? Where it says that Man, if you're gonna do anything that's gonna cause a brother or sister in Christ to stumble or to become weak, then what should you do? Not do it. What? Oh, I got the right to do this, pastor. No, you don't. You don't have the right to do anything that's gonna cause your brother and sister in Christ to stumble and be pushed away from Christ. Can I say that from the rooftops, please? Because there's too many people in the Church of America that feel like they're entitled somehow to live the life that they want to live. And the Bible's very clear that is not how we do it. That we're not to do everything we want to do, the New Testament says, because not all things are beneficial, not all things are useful. And that if we're going to cause a brother or sister in Christ to stumble, then we shouldn't do it. So what is it? Maybe that is ruining your testimony to your kids, to your coworkers, to your teammates to your family, to your fellow church members? Do you have to give up the booze? Give up some foul language maybe that's been a habit for so long you need to ask the Lord to sanctify your tongue? What is it? What is it that could cause somebody to stumble that God needs you to remove from your life so that the gospel could go forward? That's biblical. Very biblical. So what would you be willing to give up if it resulted in the furtherance of the gospel? Second question. What would you be willing to endure if it resulted in the good news of Jesus Christ being advanced? What would you be willing to endure if it resulted in the good news of Jesus Christ being advanced? 
difficulty, hard time, persecution, bad health. Nobody wants bad health. Nobody wants that bad report, but what if, what if there's doctors and nurses that won't be ministered to unless you walk through this disease? You ever think about that? Lord, I don't want this. I don't want this disease. I don't want this in my family. But Lord, I know that there's people through this that you're going to minister to. Oh my goodness. Lord, help us. Keep us all healthy. But Lord, for those that you have allowed for, to walk through some hard times in their health, Lord, would you allow us to be ministers of the gospel? That's hard. What would you be willing to endure if it resulted in the good news of Jesus being advanced? How high of a premium do you place on furthering the gospel? Do you believe and know and trust that maybe the trial you're going through right now, that God is walking through you with it? And that what God has brought you to, he's gonna see you through and he's gonna use for his glory if we'll keep our focus. If we'll keep our focus on him, on others and the mission, God's gonna use it. Because the trouble that God allows in our lives, I promise you, is never meaningless. It's never meaningless. Never. God will always use your scars to minister to other people. We have a Chain Breakers ministry that's getting ready to get started this Wednesday, an addiction recovery group that we're going to push out to the community. And there's people that are going to be involved in that ministry that have gone through it themselves. And through the scars of their past, they're going to minister out of their scars and out of their trials to minister to other people going through the same thing. What Satan meant for evil, God will always use for good if we let him. That's the key. If we let him, if we let God work through our life. The fact is right here, God was doing a great work in Paul. And it's evident at the end of the book. If we look at Philippians chapter 4 verses 21 through 22. Paul says this, you want to see the work that was happening right here? This is beautiful. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. He's talking to the church at Philippi. The brethren who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you. But get this, but especially those who are of Caesar's household. This proves that when Paul was preaching the gospel, people were getting saved and discipled, and they had now become a part of the body of Christ. <laughs> Do you have a heart that breaks like that? That's beautiful, that even in the chains that people were coming to Jesus, and he tells his brother, his, his brothers in Philippi, but especially the people that want to greet you and say hi, that are so excited about Jesus right now and can't wait to meet you, is these people in Caesar's palace who got saved while I'm in chains. It's beautiful. Guys, we're not always called to escape the trouble. We're not. But we're called to be salt and light in the presence of the trouble. I'm going to say that again. We are not always called to escape the trouble, but we are always called to be salt and light in the presence of the trouble. So think back to how we started. Think back to the things that are going on in our nation right now, the evil that's being manifested. We're not called to be out of it, necessarily. We're called to be salt and light in the midst of it. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Man, we're getting ready to, to watch this Super Bowl here, some of us, maybe if you like football next week, and you'll see in the fourth quarter that a lot of the teams, they'll do something. When the quarter changes from three to four, they'll walk to the other side of the field and everybody on the sideline, everybody on the field will be holding up four fingers. What's that about? It's a battle cry. That this is the fourth quarter. That this is not where we give up. This is not where we give in. This is not where we let off the gas. This is where we go harder. This is where everything that we've trained for the previous months and weeks in the weight room and through two-a-days in summer camp and through everything we've gone through and through all the battles in the regular season, everything we fought for is going to be laid on the field right now in the fourth quarter and we're going to give it our all and leave nothing on the field. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus Christ is calling out to all of us through the Great Commission and I believe it in my heart that we're in the fourth quarter. I don't know how much time is left on the clock. Nobody does, but I believe in my 
heart that revelation is being played out before our eyes. I believe we're in the fourth quarter. Church of Jesus Christ, this is not the time to sit back and say, well, I guess the end is near. I just can't wait till Jesus comes. This is the time to get on our horse for Jesus. Dadgummit. Let's be serious about the gospel. Let's present the truth in love. Let's be bold. Let's endure the chains. Let's endure the evil that's around us. And let's be salt and light. It's time to go hard for Jesus, not give up. It's time to go hard. We'll be going home soon, but right now it's time to go hard and leave it all in the field. I love what John Maxwell said. He said, once you live a life of significance, success will never satisfy you again. Once you live a life of significance, success will never satisfy you again. Stop chasing the American dream and start chasing the Great Commission. We need to be about Jesus. We need to take our focus off the things of the world and put it on Christ and the mission. Look past the chains and restrictions and look to the opportunities that the chains have given us to be salt and light so people can get saved. Whose eternity through Christ might you be able to change this week? By how you live your life by the things you choose to give up so the gospel can go forward, by the things you choose to endure so that the name of Jesus Christ can be made famous. That's your calling. That's my calling. And there's joy in that mission.